my old friend, the Count, as we used to call him, made very strange acquaintances at times. Let but a man have plausibility, a point of view, an enthusiasm, he would find in him an eager listener. I confess, however, that these cronies of his were rather disconcerting at times, and I own that seeing him one afternoon in the high street with a companion even more than usually voluble and odd, I own I crossed the road to avoid meeting the pair. But the Count's eyes had been too sharp for me. You remember that rather out-of-the-world friend of mine yesterday that so shocked your spruce proprieties, Richard, he said, as we walked together. Well, I'll tell you a story. As closely as I can recall this story of the Count's childhood, I have related it. The house of my first remembrance, the house that to my last hour on earth will seem home to me, stood on the verge of a wide heath. The house, the garden, the deep orchard, all had been a wedding gift to my mother from a great aunt. I remember every room of the old house, the steep stairs, the cool, apple-scented pantry. But best of all, I remember the unmeasured splendour of the heath, with its gorse and its deep canopy of sunny air. My father's will, his word, his caprice, his frown, these were the tables of the law in that small household. To my mother, he was the very meaning of her life. But nothing satisfied him. He must needs be at an extreme, and if he was compelled to conceal his discontent, there was something so bitter and imperious in his silence, so scornful a sarcasm in his speech, that we could scarcely bear it. I remember one summer's evening we had been gathering strawberries in the garden. I carried a little basket and went rummaging under the aromatic leaves. Martha was busy beside me, and in a wild race with my mother, my father helped us pick. At every ripest one, he took her in his arms to force it between her lips. And when the sun went down, he took my mother on his arm, and we all trooped together back into the cool, dusky house. As we passed into the gloaming, I saw my mother stoop impulsively and kiss his arm. He brushed her off impatiently and went into his study. I think she was happier when my father was away, for then, free from anxiety to be forever pleasing his variable moods, she could entertain herself with hopes and preparations for his return. So time went on. Yet, it seemed, as each month passed by, the house was not so happy as before. Something was fading and vanishing that would not return. On Guy Fawkes' day, Martha told me that a new household had moved into the village on the other side of the heath. After that, my father stayed away from us but seldom. At first, my mother showed her pleasure in a thousand ways, with ribbons in her hair, with new songs, though she had but a small, thin voice. But by and by, when evening after evening was spent by my father away from home, she began to be depressed. Her anxious face, the incessant interrogation of her eyes, vexed and irritated him beyond measure. Where does my father go after dinner? I asked Martha one night, when my mother was in the room. Shh, now, Master Nicholas, didn't you hear what your mamma said? She's vexed, poor lady, and master's never spending a whole day at home. Nothing but them cards, cards, cards every night at Mr. Gray's. But she doesn't mean to speak unkindly. It's a terrible scourge, his jealousy, Master Nicholas, and not manly to give it cause. A few days later I was sitting with my mother in her parlour, when my father entered and bade me put on my hat and muffler. He's going to pay a call with me, he explained curtly. As I left the room, I heard my mother say, To your friends at the Grange, I suppose. You may suppose whatever you please, he answered. The room in which the card player sat was very low-sealed. A piano stood near the window, a rosewood table with a work basket upon it by the fireplace, and some little distance away, a green card table with candles burning. After some while, the door opened, and a lady appeared.
This was Mr. Gray's sister, Jane, I learned. She seated herself at her work table and drew me to her side. Well, so this is Nicholas, she said, smiling. How very kind of you to come to see me. I looked into her eyes and knew we were friends. She smiled again. Now let me see, I have three different kinds of cake, because, I thought, I cannot in the least tell which kind he'll like best. Come, you shall choose. She rose and opened a narrow cupboard. I remember the cakes to this day. Little oval shortbreads stamped with a beehive, custards and mince pies. I took a mince pie and sat down on a footstool near Miss Gray, and she talked to me while she worked. Her voice was so quiet and musical, her neck so graceful. I thought her very beautiful, admiring especially her dark eyes when she smiled brightly and yet half sadly at me. I promised, moreover, that if she would meet me on the heath, I would show her Miller's pool. Well, Jane, what do you think of my son? said my father when we were about to leave. She bent over me and squeezed a lucky fourpence piece into my hand. I was looking at my father as she was caressing me, and I fancied a faint sneer passed over his face. But when we'd come out of the house onto the heath in the bare, keen night, never before had he seemed so wonderful a companion. He told me little stories. He began a hundred and finished none. Yet with the stars above us, they seemed a string of beads, all of bright colours. But when we were come to the house gates, he suddenly fell silent, turned an instant, and stared over the heath. How weary, flat, stale, he began, and broke off. Listen to me, Nicholas. You must grow up a man. A man, you understand. No vaporings, no posings, no caprices. It's your one and only chance in this unfaltering scheme. He scanned my face closely. You have your mother's eyes, he said musingly. And that, that's no joke. He pushed open the gate and we went in. My mother was sitting before a dying fire. Well, Nicholas, did you play cards with the gentleman? I talked to Miss Gray, I said. Really, said my mother, raising her eyebrows. And who is Miss Gray? Uh, Mr. Gray's sister. Not his wife, then? I looked towards my father in doubt. <laughs> you little fool, he said to my mother with a laugh. What a sharpshooter. My mother rose, and with a sob she hurried out. My father stood very still. And then with a sigh he sat down at my mother's writing table and scribbled a few words on a slip of paper. There, Nicholas, just tap on your mother's door with that. Good night, old fellow. I hastened upstairs and delivered the message. My mother was crying when she opened the door. But presently, afterwards, I heard her run down quickly, and in a while my father and mother came upstairs together, arm in arm, and by her light talk and laughter you might suppose she had no knowledge of care or trouble at all. Never afterwards did I see so much gaiety and youthfulness in my mother's face as when she sat next morning with us at breakfast. My father seemed to find as much pleasure or relief in her good spirits as I did, and a delight in exercising his ingenuity to quicken her humour. It was but a transient morning of sunshine, however, and as the brief and sombre day waned, its gloom pervaded the house. In the evening, my father left us to our solitude as usual. On St. Stephen's Day, I went to Miller's Pool. I was stooping down at the edge, breaking the splinters of ice, when I heard a voice calling me. It was Jane Grey, walking on the heath with my father. So you see, I have kept my promise she said. But you promised to come by yourself. Well, so I will then. She turned to my father. 
Nicholas shall take me home to tea, and you can call for him in the evening. That is, if you are coming. Do you care whether I come or not? he said moodily. You are my friend. Of course I care. He scrutinised her through half-closed lids. His face was haggard, gloomy with ennui. How you harp on the word, you punctilious Jane. Do you suppose I'm still in my teens? It amuses me to hear you women talk. It's little you ever really feel. I don't think I'm quite without feeling, she replied. You are a little difficult, you know. Difficult? It's age, my dear Jane. Age. It turns one to stone. With you young people, life's a dream. Ask Nicholas here. He shrugged. But one wakes on a devilish hard pallet. She continued to smile, yet with tears in her eyes. You asked me to be fearless, sincere, to speak my heart. I wonder, do you? The truth is, Jane, my father said slowly, I am past sincerity now. And as for heart, it is a quite discredited organ at forty. And when youth and sentiment are gone, why, go to, dear lady, Existence proves nothing but brazen inanity afterwards. But there's always that turning left to the dullest and dustiest road. Oblivion. Take care of her, Nicholas. Au revoir. Upon my word, I almost wish it was goodbye. He turned with an affected laugh and left us. What does my father mean by wishing us goodbye? I asked. My companion bent down and put her hands on my shoulders. My dear Nicholas, you must be a good son to your mother. Brave and kind, will you? He hardly ever speaks to mother now. She pressed her lips to my cheek. We must do our best, mustn't we? And then we took hands and ran till we were out of breath towards the distant lights of the thorns. I had been some time in bed when my mother came into my room. Where have you been all evening? she said. Miss Gray asked me to stay to tea. Did I give you permission to go to tea with Miss Gray? I made no answer. If you go to that house again, I shall beat you. You hear me, Nicholas? Alone or with your father, if you go there again, I shall beat you. I didn't reply. But when my mother had gone, without kissing me, I cried noiselessly on into my pillow. Life had become a little colder and stranger. Hardly a week passed now without some bitter quarrel. On St. Valentine's Day, things came to a worse pass than ever. It had always been my father's custom to hang my mother a valentine on the handle of her parlour door, a string of pearls, a fan, whatever it might be. She came down early this morning and sat looking out at the falling snow. He took no notice of her. I think he had not really forgotten the day, for I found long afterwards in his bureau a bracelet, purchased but a week before, with her name written inside the case. Yet it seemed to be the absence of this little gift that had driven my mother beyond reason. Towards evening, tired of the house, I played for a while in the snow. At nightfall, I went in, and in the dark heard angry voices. My father came out of the dining room and looked at me in silence. My mother followed him. It shall learn to hate you, she cried. I will teach it every moment to hate and despise you as I, oh, I hate and despise you. My father looked at her calmly and profoundly. Very well, then. You have chosen, he said coldly. It has always lain with you. You have exaggerated, you have raved, and now you have said what can never be forgotten. Pray do not imagine, however, that I am defending myself. I have nothing to defend. I think of no one but myself, no one. <laughs> 
Perhaps, indeed, you yourself... <sighs> well, life is... <sighs> I have done. So be it. He stood looking out of the door. You see, it's snowing, he said, as if to himself. All day long the snow had been falling continuously. My father glanced back for an instant into the house, and, as I fancy, regarded me with a kind of strange, close earnestness. But he went out, and his footsteps were instantly silenced. My mother stumbled to the door. Arthur, Arthur, she cried. It's St. Valentine's Day. That was all I meant. Come back, come back. But perhaps my father was already out of hearing. As far back as memory carried me, it had been our custom to make a Valentine's feast. This same anniversary had, last year, brought about a tender reconciliation between my father and mother, after a quarrel that meant how little then and I remember on this day to have seen the first fast-sealed buds upon the almond tree. When I went to the dining room later, my mother was kneeling by the fireside, gazing into the flames. Martha knocked at the door when the clock struck eight. Dinner is ready, ma'am. My mother glanced at the clock. Oh, just a little while longer, tell Mrs. Ryder. Your master will be home in a minute. She rose and placed the claret in the hearth. Did you hear anything, Nicholas? Run to the door and listen. It stopped snowing, I said, peering out into the darkness. But there isn't anybody there, Mother. The hours passed heavily from quarter on to quarter. Already midnight would be the next hour to be chimed. I was still hungry and very tired. The candles began to burn low. Mrs. Ryder retired with Martha. They left me, I think, to be my mother's company. We shared the steaming wine together when they were gone. We said very little, but I looked softly into her grey, childish eyes, and we kissed one another, kneeling there together before the fire. But by and by, in the silent house, drowsiness vanquished me. I began to nod, and very soon dreams stalked in, mingling with reality. It was early morning when I awoke, cold and miserable in my uncomfortable resting place. My mother was still asleep. I touched her sleeve, and the lids drew back from her eyes. Her face clouded instantly. What? Nothing, nothing? And suddenly, in a gush of agony, remembrance of the night returned to her. She hid her face in her hands, rocking her body gently to and fro, I returned to the table on which was set out the mockery of our Valentine feast. I put a handful of biscuits in my pocket, for a determination had taken me to go out on the heath. A project was also forming in my mind of walking over to the Thorns. I would tell Miss Grey all about my adventure of the night spent in the dining room. So, moving stealthily, I stole unnoticed from the room and ran joyously out into the wintry morning. Already dawn was clear and high in the sky, and snow lay crisp across every surface. As I went on my way, munching my biscuits, I brooded deliciously on the breakfast which Miss Grey would doubtless give me, and almost forgot the troubled house I had left behind. At length I climbed a smooth ridge and looked down. Before me grew a crimson hawthorn tree that often in past Aprils I had used for a green tent from the showers. But now it was a long expanse of unshadowed whiteness. Nearby, I perceived a figure stretched out along the snow and knew instinctively that it was my father lying there. The sight did not then dismay me. I felt no sorrow but stood beside the body, regarding it only with a kind of earnest curiosity, yet perhaps with a remote pity, too, that he could not see me in the beautiful morning. His grey hand lay arched in the snow. A smear of dried blood showed on his darkened face. 
I understood that he was dead, and had already begun speculating on what would happen in the house now that he was gone, his influence, his authority, his discord. I remembered, too, that I was alone, was master of this immense secret, and that I must go home and tell my mother. My thoughts were suddenly broken in on by Martha Rod. She stood looking down on me from the ridge from which I had but just now descended. Look, Martha, look, I cried as she approached. I found him in the snow. He's dead. And suddenly a bond seemed to snap in my heart. The tears gushed into my eyes, and I clung to the poor girl, sobbing bitterly. Oh, Master Nicholas, she cried. What will your poor mamma do now, and him gone? My father's body was brought home and laid in my mother's little parlour. The house was darkened. My mother was ill. And for some inexplicable reason, I connected her illness with the bevy of gentlemen dressed in black who came one morning to the house and walked away together over the heath. Finally, Mrs. Marshall drove up one afternoon from Islington, and by the bundles she had brought with her, I knew that she was come, as once before in my experience, to stay. I was playing on the morrow in the hall when I heard Mrs. Marshall and Mrs. Ryder gossiping on their way up from the kitchen. No, Mrs. Marshall, nothing, Mrs. Ryder was saying. Not one word. And now the poor dear lady left quite alone. I knew to my sorrow that there was words in the house, but there, wheresoever you be, there's that. Wasn't there talk of some... Talk, Mrs. Marshall. I scorn the word. A pinch of truth in a hogshead of falsehood. But then I was discovered, crouched on the stairs. And this is the poor fatherless mannequin, I suppose, said Mrs. Marshall. Well, now, and don't you remember me, little man? He ought to now. He's a good boy, said Mrs. Ryder, and I hope and pray he'll be a comfort to his poor widowed mother, if so be. They glanced earnestly at one another, and Mrs. Marshall drew a big leather purse from her pocket and selected a bright halfpenny piece. I make no doubt he will, poor mite, she said cheerfully. I took the halfpenny in silence, and the two women went on upstairs. In the afternoon, I went out onto the heath with a shovel, intent on building a great tomb in the snow. I laboured very busily, shoveling, moulding, stamping. So intent was I that I did not see Miss Grey until she was beside me. Nicholas? She sat on my shapeless mound of snow and took me by the hand. Then she drew up her veil, and I saw her face pale and darkened, her dark eyes gravely gazing into mine. My poor, poor Nicholas, what can I say? She drew back and looked out over the heath towards the house. They've put my father in the little parlour. In his coffin, of course. You know he's dead. And Mrs. Marshall's come. She gave me a halfpenny. I took it out of my pocket and showed it to her. That's very nice, she said. And look, I'm going to give you a little keepsake too, just between you and me. It was a small silver box that she drew from her muff, and embossed in the lid was a crucifix. Now, who's given you this, she said softly, putting the box into my hand. You. Your friend, Jane Grey, she said. And now, tell me which room is... is the little parlour. Is it that window at the corner? I shook my head. No, it's at the back. Would you like to see my father? She started, her dark eyes dwelling strangely on mine. But Nicholas, you poor lamb, where? If you were to come this evening, I would be playing in the hall. Nobody would see you. Oh, what are you saying? She stood up, drawing down her veil. 
I'll come, I'll come. We can both still, still be loyal to him, can't we, Nicholas? She walked away quickly. I looked at my silver box with great satisfaction, and after opening it, put it in my pocket, and continued my building for a while. But now zest for it was gone, and I began to feel cold as darkness gathered. So I went home. I ate my tea in solitude. A peculiar, suppressed stir was in the house. I wondered what could be the cause of it, and began to be afraid of my project being discovered. Nonetheless, I was playing in the evening, as I had promised, close to the hall door. Run down to the kitchen, dearie, said Martha. Her cheeks were flushed. She was carrying a can of steaming water. You must keep very, very quiet this evening and go to bed like a good boy and perhaps tomorrow I'll tell you a great secret. She kissed me hastily and hurried away. Almost as soon as she was gone, I heard a light rap on the door. It seemed that Jane Grey had brought in with her the cold and freshness of the woods. I led the way down the corridor into the small, silent room. The air was still languid with the perfume of flowers. I'm sorry, I said, but they've nailed it down. Martha says the men came this afternoon. Miss Grey took a little bunch of snowdrops from her bosom and hid them among the wreaths of flowers, and she knelt down with a small silver cross pressed to her lips. And while I watched her praying, I listened to the quiet footsteps passing to and fro in the room above. Suddenly, the silence was broken by a small, continuous, angry crying. Miss Grey looked up. What was that? I stared at her. It sounds just like a little baby, I said. She crossed herself hastily and rose. Nicholas? she said in a strange, bewildered voice. She looked at me lovingly, then went out as she had entered. I did not so much as peep into the darkness after her, but busy with a hundred thoughts, returned to my play. Long past my usual bedtime, as I sat sipping a mug of hot milk before the kitchen fire, Martha told me her secret. So, my impossible companion in the high street yesterday was own and only brother to your crazy old friend, Richard, said the Count. His only brother, he added, in a muse. The Almond Tree was written by Walter de la Mare and read by Julian Wadham. The producer was Lawrence Jackson.